Yeah, I'm glad you said that because we just updated it. <laughs> <laughs> the previous five years, it was a, it was not a good website, but we sort of we you know I think we we convinced the uh, the administration that hey we should probably hire like an outside vendor to actually you know <laughs> take our take our website into the 21st century. So good, I'm glad you. I, I will pass it on to our staff that that visitors are having um, no problem navigating <laughs> the new website. <laughs> I live in Chicago, and the Chicago website trying to navigate is terrible. So uh, you, oh. Clarkston is very much the model of of how cities should be. I think. One of the things that strikes me, I, you know, so I just mentioned I live in Chicago and, and obviously our mayor has a full time job. We're hearing so much about corruption, conflicts of interest kinds of questions. Is there ever any tension in in small towns where the mayor is part time, the city council is part time and these people have other jobs? Is there ever sort of tension about, you know, the the influence of people's other employment and, and what that might mean in their roles on city council or as mayor? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think there's a there tends to be sort of a standard ethics code that at least we follow in Clarkston. I think it's sort of standard across at least Georgia cities, where you know if a city council is voting on something that involves a contract or money or some sort of direct impact to to like the business, I imagine is more sort of relevant of an elected official. Then you know the ethics code says you have to you know be uh, you can't be involved in that. You have to recuse yourself. You know, there are, I think, at least in Clarkston, you know, a basic ethics code that sort of says, here's what you can and can't do. You know, beyond that, though, I think whether you're talking about sort of issue advocacy or just having elected officials who have a broad range of experience in the real world, I think that's kind of what you want. And, I, you know, I, it's hard, so hard to find good people to run for local office, particularly in small towns. We end up kind of just getting whoever's willing to volunteer to do it. And, you know, whether it's the pay's too low or it's sort of, you know, kind of work you have to do after your, your full-time job is done, you know, after hours or on the weekends. I think there should be a greater recognition that a diversity of opinions in a city council chamber is a good thing because if you only have sort of one set of people who only has one perspective making votes and deciding policy, I think you're going to, and you're not good about doing civic engagement, you know, you're really going to get a lot of the same old, you know, sort of results. And so, you know, I think um, it's, it's worked well for Clarkston, at least recently, uh, you know, before we went to a city manager, former government, just which was just five years ago, the mayor and council were in charge of running the city and they still got paid $6,000 and $3,000 a year. So that was kind of a disaster, quite frankly, um, having amateur people who got paid very little, who were actually in charge of like balancing the budget um, and running departments. And, you know, that, that's when corruption happens. When you have a council member who's in charge of like the public works committee and they're the ones who are signing off on contracts. That's kind of like when you, you ever heard the old adage of uh, a son-in-law or a brother-in-law, you know, fund, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, the, the, the political, you know, powerful people use their position to, um, you know, hire the, the sorry son of a gun son-in-law who <laughs> can't get a job anywhere else. <laughs> so, you know, that, that, that I think is, is a, is a real issue. Not for the bigger cities, I, I, I'm sure it's much more complicated. I mean, you know, Clarkson is not talking about huge procurement contracts. I mean, everything that we do and we spend money is always like voted on like in the public. It's usually like the only agenda item that's related to it. So there's never like these huge agendas with like 50 things on them and somewhere tucked in there is a contract between X, Y, and Z, you know, so at least in small town politics, you know, everything is transparent in the sense that um, there's not so much going on. So everything, everyone kind of knows what's going on. There's not much else going on. <laughs> One of the things I think is so fascinating about Clarkston, especially since you've become mayor in the time that you've been there, is the really progressive policies that you have started to implement in terms of living wage and renewable energy and things like that. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and what the reaction has been been in the city to these kinds of policies? Yeah, well, you know, I was a Bernie Sanders delegate. I've been involved in, in the Democratic Party and sort of the progressive side of Democratic politics for many years. And, you know, I'm a big believer in evidence-based policymaking. And so it's, 
you know, when you talk about things like clean energy and their living wage or having welcoming policies for immigrants, you know, they're, they're referred to as progressive and, you know, you know, liberal and leftist policies. Uh, but to me, they're just the policies that make the most sense. Um, if you use science, if you use logic and reason and evidence to say, here is how we are going to, you know, run our community and here's the direction we're going to go. You know, transitioning to 100% clean energy, paying people a living wage, they can actually afford to live in your town, creating policies that are good for immigrants, which also happen to have a, a, an ancillary effect of helping everyone who's not an immigrant also feel connected and welcomed in their own community. And so these are just you know smart things to do. Uh, certainly in, 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 in small towns are no different than big towns. There's always going to be people who are sort of the the cautionary, you know, alarmists who will say, if we do this, you know, all, the worst possible thing can happen. But, you know, that's politics. I mean, it's, you know, it takes, you know, you, you need to have people who are willing to to lead um, and to take take your community and take your, you know, take the direction into something that maybe quite hasn't been completely figured out. But from, you know, what we have seen, at least on a lot of these issues you mentioned, it seems like it, it makes the most sense. There's always going to be a little nuance here and there of how things are implemented, um, but the the general sort of tone, at least for Clarkson, of being forward thinking, of being innovative, of being willing to try new things, of being um, opening open to a to a reality that America is going to be a lot more diverse in languages, religions, and ethnicities, and you know, saying this is where we want to go, I think is it's it's it's, it's politically risky. I didn't know if I was going to get reelected. I definitely I had a challenger this last November who basically ran as sort of we're being too we're doing too friendly to refugees. Um, and that was that's how I had to kind of defend myself, you know, of, you know, to you know, and and remember, like the vast majority of residents in Clarkston can't vote, and they are refugees or recent refugees. And so basically, you know, I was trying to create policies that were were good for. The vast majority of our residents, but the majority of the voting population wasn't refugee, and so that was a little bit of a risky thing to do. But I, th- I thought it was the right thing to do. the The long term impact, I think, on Clarkston is is I'm I'm seeing it already. You know, when we talk about decriminalizing decriminalizing marijuana possession, as as one policy example, you know, we've got young people moving to our city who say, you know, that is the kind of place that I want to live. You know, someone that doesn't treat you know, doesn't, you know, fully participate in the war on drugs uh, because it's been a complete failure. Um, and so, you know, from a marketing perspective, when you lay out your set of principles and the future vision of what you want your community to go to, you find that in a, and particularly in a place like Atlanta, that has 6 million people living, you know, in this uh, area, you f- end up finding you've got people who think the same way and they end up moving into the, your town. <laughs> And uh, and you hope that enough of them move in to add more to the electorate that will keep the policies going. So my my goal, hopefully, in the, you know by the next election, four years from now, the next mayor will be as progressive and forward thinking. Will continue the policies, and then we'll have a critical mass of residents and voters who will have a unifying vision of uh, and a, an agreement that that's the direction we want to go, and that they'll vote, <laughs> and then, you know reelect that vision. Do you think that's maybe one of the ways we can get more progressive policies statewide, nationwide, is to start in really local places and sort of push out from there? Oh, definitely. Yeah. You know, they always, you always hear this thing about states being the laboratories of democracy. I think you could, that same logic applies to small cities and, you know, other smaller municipalities and counties. You know, we have the opportunity to try something um, before someone else tries it. And in Georgia, we have a lot of um, what's called home rule power. And so there's a lot of things that local cities can do without the permission of the legislature, unless the legislature has preempted it. <laughs> And so with the decriminalization of marijuana, you know, this was something that was seen as very radical when we introduced it three years ago. But today, you know, three years after Clarkson has passed, passed our decriminalization of marijuana possession, the city of Atlanta has passed it, the city of Savannah, the city of Augusta, the city of South Fulton, of College Park. So basically, like larger and medium and larger sized cities waited to see how Clarkston did. Okay, okay. so after a year of decriminalizing marijuana, Clarkston didn't turn into a drug haven. <laughs> you know, we didn't have people coming to Clarkston in droves to get high and cause mischief. Basically, nothing changed, to be quite frank. You know, it just, it just meant that an average of 
70 people a year didn't get arrested and go to jail and then and get a criminal record who were caught with small amounts of marijuana possession in Clarkston. And so I think, you know, that, is, that gave the city of Atlanta, being the biggest city in Georgia, sort of enough evidence to say, OK, well, we're willing to try this since it worked OK in Clarkston. Is there anything else that you would like to make sure that our listeners hear about? One thing that I will mention is that Clarkston and just through my role as mayor and how ethnically and religiously diverse our community is, um, has been held up as a, a model for not just places around America, but places around the world. And, and there's just um, there's an interesting sort of dynamic happening in places like Europe where the far right political sphere is gaining ground. Um, and if you look in, in, in Italy, as an example, they've just had a major power shift and a new coalition government between the far right league party and then the five star movement forming a coalition government. And up until that time, you know, the, the, that the, the, what was called the democratic government in Italy was creating policies that were um, helping to alleviate the, the, the migration and refugee crisis that's happening worldwide. Uh, the United Nations has pointed out and you know, raised the alarm bells that we are in one of the worst humanitarian crises since the end of uh, World War II. Uh, we literally have 23 million people that are in refugee status. 10 million um, are asylum seekers, and another 65 million are internally displaced people within their own countries. And so we, you know, we nearly have 100 million people worldwide that are being forced from their homes through no fault of their own um, and are having to find some sort of safety or security and, and, and hope for a future um, that is really uncertain. And, and it's going to take a, a global response. It's going to take a response not just from the federal government, but it's going to take a response from local municipalities and local leaders, as well as private citizens and even religious groups and even corporations. And, you know, the thing about Clarkson's history is that we've been opening our doors and being a welcoming community for 35 years. And we probably will have to be a welcoming community for another 35 years because it doesn't look like this crisis is going to go away anytime soon. And I think it's really important. I mean, if you look at the rhetoric that's coming out of the Trump administration, you know, it's a lot of quasi passive aggressive racism. It's, a, it's, it's basically saying that if we have all these immigrants come into our country, that America as we know it will change forever. And I always invite people to come and visit Clarkston because we are a microcosm of what a future America will look like by 2050. It'll be majority non-white. It'll be a majority of of, of a lot of different religions and languages. And if you come to Clarkston, you don't see an America that's been wiped out and replaced by some exotic, foreign, oppressive you know, society. What you see is America, a, a place that values freedom of speech and freedom of religion, but also follows the rule of law. And so you're w welcome to practice your religion and have your identity and culture, but we're still going to have the basic principles of liberties and justice um, that, that has been a part of this country's, I think, you know, bedrock in our constitution for, for many, many years. And it ain't perfect, but the reality is that, that as Clarkston has gotten more diverse, I would argue that it has made us a stronger community. It certainly made us a lot more interesting. Um, <laughs> there's never a dull day in Clarkston. It's not going to be a cookie cutter lifestyle where everyone looks the same and talks the same and has the same viewpoint, you know, you're going to have a lot more sort of kind of conflicts, but, you know, we're, we're consistently ranked one of the top 50 safest cities in Georgia. We're a, a very peaceful community, a very walkable community. And just like we can't control what's happening in other parts of the world and we can't even control what's happening, we can't make our president, you know, behave better or, you know, mm -hmm. be more open-minded to, you know, the people who are not like us. Um, what we can do is lead by example. And so, for Clarkson's purposes, we're going to keep leading by example. We're going to try to envision and create the world that we wish to live in. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I can only hope that other people will, will take inspiration from our example. Well, that is beautiful. And now I want to move to Clarkston, Georgia. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to me. This has been really fascinating. I have lived in small towns, but before I was paying much attention to politics and government, and you know, now I live in a big city and know how that works. So 
it's really fascinating to me to to hear about how things work in in a place like Clarkston and I just think it it sounds like such a, a great place to live and sounds like you and the council 